Hi, friends. We're glad you're back. Last week, Pastor Matt talked about complete victory. Jesus didn't come for a truce. He didn't come for a tie, but he came for a complete victory. And that's what we have in Christ, a complete victory. So today, get ready. We're going to learn about our victory in Jesus Christ. And you can walk in victory, and I can walk in victory. Does that mean we're not going to have difficulty or trouble? Not at all. We're going to have life's challenges. But I want to assure you, life is a lot better with Christ. So perk up, listen, get ready. Let's apply the principles to God's Word to our own personal life, and life will go much better. God bless you. Shadows deepen. 
But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this?
feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. feet of Jesus, the greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. Love. 
love you. All I want to do is worship you. All I want to do is stay here right at your feet. And as I lift my hands towards heaven, let your glory fall down on me. Rekindle the fire within me, Lord, once again. All I want to do is love you. All I want to do is worship you. All I want to do is stay here right at your feet. As I lift my hands. As I lift my hands to heaven. Let your glory fall down on me. Rekindle the fire within me, Lord, once again. Hallelujah, Lord. All I want to do is love you. All I want to do is worship you. All I want to do is stay here right at your feet. As I lift my hands towards heaven, let your glory fall down on me. Rekindle that fire within me, Lord, once again. Can we sing that one more time? Oh, yes. All I want to do is love you. All I want to do is worship you. All I want to do is stay Let your glory fall down on me. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Can we take just a few minutes and worship the King of Kings?
You guys believe that? Yeah, how many of you guys really enjoyed worship? Yeah, I did too. Would you guys stand up with me? Go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to continue our series, Complete Victory in Christ. And today, we're going to concentrate on the spirit of willingness. We've got to be willing to do what God's called us to do, right? Yeah, we have to. So we're going to look at what Paul wrote to his people and what he's writing to us, and we're going to study. Does that sound good to you guys? Yeah, I'm fired up about it too. And if you're at home, thank you so much for streaming. We're glad you're a part of this. Let's go ahead and begin. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed... He's not talking to teenagers there. Always obeyed, okay? He's talking to somebody else. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Father... We thank you for the reading of your word. We pray, God, to be more like you, God, that we could do what you say to do, God, and we could go where you say to go. Speak to our hearts and make us like you. This morning we pray, and everyone says, amen, amen. You may be seated. Wave at your neighbor. Wave at your neighbor. I'm glad that you're here this Memorial Weekend. Thank you so much for being a part of this, guys. Wherever you're streaming from, once again, we are glad that you're a part of this. Now, what I want to concentrate on today is willingness. And I was thinking of the help wanted sign, okay? I was thinking about having a help wanted sign that simply said willingness. Because if there's one thing that we can say, the Bible shows us over and over and over, Christ needs our participation. (laughs) We need to be willing. I was running through the different areas of local government and and businesses and, of course, through Lawton. And right now, I've never seen more signs out, help wanted signs. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and they're desperate signs. My goodness, they're asking all kinds of things. Like, we want help now. You can start today. Some of them I can't repeat because they had a little bit of profanity with them, trying to get people's attention that we need help. So I guess whoever thinks that you can cut checks and send them out and keep people at home and it's not bad on the economy, I don't know if they know what they're talking about. It has certainly influenced it, right? Yeah, it really has. And then you see other signs that says part-time and full-time. Some of the signs even say, we're offering 2 to $3 above minimum wage. Those burgers are about to go higher, guys. You're going to have to remortgage your house to go out to eat. My goodness. Okay? We have to be careful. But we see all these help wanted signs everywhere. And in through the Bible, we see some of the similar signs. We, through it, we see it through stories and illustrations. We see that if we don't do it God's way, we see a big red sign that says devastation ahead, destruction ahead, right? We see what sin causes, and it causes death and takes things out of people's life that they could have had. But at the same point, we see wonderful stories in the Bible that shows us what happens when we do hide ourselves in Christ Jesus, when we do do the things that the Lord has called us to do, amen? And we see that, but we see these help-wanted signs like that everywhere. And in the church, oh, if the church could stick up help-wanted signs, you would walk down the children's aisle, and I'm sure there might be help-wanted in every door, right? Maybe in the youth department or the music department, maybe in our greeting in the various adult ministries, you would see that multiple times, help-wanted everywhere. Because we as a church, as we grow, we need more help. But as we look at the Bible, we see that help wanted sign in there, so to speak, that Christ needs our willingness. Because the reality is it doesn't matter if they average $1,000 an hour above minimum wage. It doesn't matter what they advertise, if they need it today or tomorrow or part-time or full-time. If nobody's willing, guess what you have? We have a vacant job, don't we? It doesn't matter. So the sign is just a sign. It's not until we engage in the willingness and say, God, I want to do what you want me to do. And that's how Christianity is. God has things for us to take on and things for us to do and things that will not only help us, but will encourage others. But if we're not willing, how many of you guys know that's a bad thing? In the Garden of Gethsemane, and we'll get to that shortly, but in the Garden of Gethsemane, what's the famous line? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we know that we all struggle with that. So we have to pray and ask God, God, help me with the spirit of willingness. Because we know that in Christ Jesus we can have complete victory. But we have to be willing to do what he said to do and go where he says to go. Amen? We can receive that this morning. But as I read from the Apostle Paul here, one of the first things that I see is the willingness for a transformed life. What's the very first step? Well, we have to be willing to have a transformed life. 
We have to be willing to say, Jesus Christ, you are the one who transforms, and I want that. Well, how did you get that out of there? Well, as Paul is writing to his friends, to these people in in Philippi, it's very obvious that he's not writing to people who are unsaved. He's writing to people who have decided that Christ is their Savior, that Christ is the authority, that they have decided that Christ is the only way to the Father. We can see that here by what he's saying. You've always obeyed. What has he shown us? He's shown us that they're a part of that transformational living. And whether if you're not a Christian, the very first step that we all know is to ask Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior into your heart. To ask the one who can transform, let that person, which is Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, into your heart and change you. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen. Acts 4 and 12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven among men by which one must be saved. To the unbeliever, I love it because Scripture makes it simple. You can stop looking. There is no one else. (laughs) To the unbeliever out there, if you're saying, I don't know where to look, I can tell you where to look. It's in the Bible, and his name is Jesus Christ, because there is no one else. To the believer, that gets us excited and gets us pumped. Why? Because I found the one. I found the answer, right? We know that, and that should be exciting. Should elate our spirits to know that we don't have to look anymore. 1 Corinthians 3 and 11, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. To the unbeliever, that scripture shows us, stop building on sinking sand. If you're building on any other foundation than Jesus Christ, then it's really not a foundation. And you're just building on sinking sand. We can't build on material possessions or our education or anything along those lines. We have to build on Jesus Christ. Now, those things are good, and we can use those to certainly influence the kingdom. But how many of you know that Jesus Christ is the only foundation? Now, for the believer, that should make us really excited because that means that I can keep building. Amen? Yeah, I can keep doing things for Christ and keep doing what he's asked me to do. I can keep saying the things that he's told me to say. And I can just make that a perpetual motion because I can build and build and build. Why? Because I have the right foundation in my life. But I have to go back and be open to what? The one who can transform. And that's Jesus Christ and him and him alone. Amen? Okay, Matthew 28 and 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. John 3 and 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Now, to the unbeliever, I'm going to have to say stop. Because you're up underneath the understanding that you're under authority, and you're really not up underneath authority if you have not submitted your life to Jesus Christ. Because he is the true authority. All authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. You're really up underneath a fantasy of authority or a mirage or, or, or I know that we have positions and titles and things, but that's not the true authority. The true authority can only be found in the one who can transform our lives, which is Jesus Christ. And we have to say all authority is found in you. Now, to the believer, that's great news because that means that my circumstance doesn't have me. That means that my situation doesn't have me. That means that Jesus Christ has the circumstance and has the situation. And as I hide myself in him, I can walk in the authority that he's given me. I can take power and authority over that situation. Now, it doesn't mean that I'll escape it. It doesn't mean that I won't have to walk through it. But what it does mean is I don't have to bow my knee to that situation. Instead, I get to bow my knee to Jesus Christ because all authority and power is found in him. But I go back and I have to be willing to say, you know what? My life needs a transformation and I have to be open to it. There's only one that I can find that in and his name is Jesus Christ. As Paul continues to write here, he shows us that we have to have a willingness to be ruled. Ooh, and the crowd goes silent, right? It's tough, it's tough. Especially when we get next to days like this and Memorial Day, and we're so grateful for those who have laid down their lives, right? Yes, we are. We're grateful for those who have made America what it is today. The freedoms that we get to enjoy, the freedom of speech and religion and assembly and all these wonderful rights that we have, and we thank everybody who's been a part of that. But here, under the law and the authority of Christ, and I hesitate to say law, but up underneath the authority of Christ, we are ruled by Him. Paul says this in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. Well, what are they obeying? Well, they're obeying what Christ has breathed into Paul to send to them to do, which is what Christ is telling us to do. 
And it shows us here that Paul is trying to communicate that you have been ruled. You have been faithful in being ruled. Because we're now up underneath the rule of Jesus Christ. Let him rule and reign in our hearts. Amen? Yeah, and that's tough to handle. <laughs> that's the reason why we got to pray for willingness. God, help me be willing to do that. Oswald Chambers in My Utmost for His Highest says it like this. Our Lord never insists on obedience. He stresses very definitely what we ought to do, but he never forces us to do it. We have to obey him out of oneness of spirit with him. That is why whenever our Lord talked about discipleship, he prefaced it with an if meaning. You do not need to do this unless you desire to do so. Luke 9 and 23. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. I want to be in the if crowd. If anyone wants to follow me, that means I have to submit myself to the rule and to the reign of Jesus Christ. And I have to be willing because there's going to be some things that I have to change. There's going to be some things that I can no longer do, even no matter how bad I want to do them. But I have to say, God, make me willing to be ruled by you. Let me be willing to be an obedient. Now, if you've ever taken care of a child you know that obedience does not come natural. Yeah, we're going to youth, we're going to kids camp, pray for us. It's going to be hot and sticky, and uh, Thursday is going to come, and we'll be ready for it, but we'll have a lot of fun because we're going to teach kids about Jesus. But we're going to learn about some of that obedience <laughs> and influence, right? But if you've ever been around a child, you understand how it's not natural to us. But if we'll fight through that and say, God, I still want to be submitted to your rule and to your reign, Romans 6 and 16 helps us with this. It says, Do you not know that if, you're, if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? And Paul goes on, he says, Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So he shows us there that whatever we become obedient to is what becomes our master, is what we become ruled by. But the good news is that if we become more and more obedient to Jesus Christ, doing the things that he has called us to be, submitting our lives and our heart to him, rightness or righteousness or rightness with God, and we become obedient and we become slaves to the most high God. We become in that place where God can use us. But it's not natural. It's not natural for us to do that. And we see this throughout eternity. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18, 19, and 20. I'm just going to park there for a moment. But here, here God is dealing with his children. I have a 10-year-old. Her name is Callie. I love her very much. And sometimes I get aggravated. Does anybody ever get aggravated with your kids? Yeah, time to time, you know. We get, and it doesn't, doesn't get any better the older they get, I don't suppose. I don't know. That's what I've been told. Okay, But I know that sometimes when I get aggravated or I get frustrated because she's not doing something, I've got to remember that I'm a kid too because I'm a child of the Most High God. And sometimes I do things that are really stupid. Sometimes I, sometimes I do things that are rebellious and I don't need to do. Sometimes I definitely say things that I shouldn't say, right? And we know that. So we have to go back and say, okay, I know that I'm a child of the Most High God. And here we see a loving God pursuing His children once again. I love verse 18. After the first 17 verses, he has laid it out to them, man. Here's your sin. I mean, the evidence is there. They have done things to dishonor God. They have done idolatry. They have chased, uh, they have ran from God instead of to God. And yet this is what we see. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. What a loving God. I mean, here he has all the evidence against them, yet he's still once again saying, come, let us reason. Let us talk. Now, this is for our culture today, for sure. They would get caught in what we would call the sin cycle, I guess is a good word. Two or three generations would be going good, and then it seems like these generations coming up would forget how bad it was and deny God and do all these things. Then God would have to get their attention, and then they would go back two, three, four generations and do good. And if we're not aware, we could be in that third, fourth, fifth generation in America. We forgot what it's taken to get to where we're at. We forgot that it took men and women laying down their lives on battlefields all across the world to keep from tyranny and communism and socialism and these things that we say is okay today that's not okay. 
And we're at that place where we have to make a decision. Are we going to be back in that cycle? Because it's really easy to get comfortable and forget what it took to get to where we're at. And throughout the Old Testament, we see that cycle. We see that the children of Israel would do that, yet we see a loving God saying, come back, let us reason. And he warned them, if you refuse and you rebel, you're going to be eaten by the sword. You're going to be conquered, and we don't have time to go into everything that they had done. But it was that cycle. Thank God for Jesus Christ because he broke the cycle. (laughs) There's not a day of the year that we have to go to and wait to get sins rolled forward or anything like that. At the point that I sin, at the point that I know I'm not right with Jesus Christ, or at the point that we need salvation, we can bow our knee and raise our head and say, Christ, come into my heart and change me. I want to be transformed. But I have to be willing To be transformed, I have to be willing to be ruled. See, a ruler tells you how to do things. That's the reason why we had the American Revolution. That's the reason why people lost their lives. That's the reason why we defend against communism and socialism and Marxism and these things that we don't necessarily talk about all the time, but we need to because it's not something that we want to be a part of because if we do history, we see that those things never worked. And I'll get off my soapbox. But it is Memorial Day weekend. We remember. It wouldn't hurt us to remember some of that stuff. Remember the children of Israel, that the cycle didn't, didn't help. And God can free you from your cycle that you're in, from your sin cycle. From that situation where anxiety crawls up on you and you can't get it off. From that situation where depression grabs your life. That sin that so easily besets us, we can break that off because through Jesus Christ, we have the power to be ruled by Him so He can tell us what to do and how to fight it. This cycle has been broken through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we have to be willing to be ruled. Verse 19 of Isaiah chapter 1, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. If we're willing and obedient to be ruled by Jesus Christ. There's a goodness that we have no idea of. But we have to be willing to say, God, I want my life to be transformed, and I want to be ruled by you. Help me with my willingness. And God knows that we're people, and we need help with that. But we know that we can walk in that complete victory through Jesus Christ with the willingness. With the willingness. Paul continues to write here, And we have to have a willingness to do. So we know that we have to have a willingness to be transformed, which we know that only happens through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We have to have a willingness to be ruled, which is really difficult, especially when you live in a country with so many freedoms as we have today. But we still have to be ruled by Jesus Christ and what He says to do. And then we have to have the willingness to do. It's not just enough to sit back and say, God, as it comes, I will do. But we have to live out this transformational life that we walk in, and we have to do it with love. Paul is instructing his leaders here. He's instructing these people who are reading, his followers, the followers of Jesus. He says, work out your own salvation. Then he says, God works in us, and then he continues, work for his good pleasure. That's a whole lot of working, isn't it? My goodness, work, 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 all day long. Work, work, work while I sing this song. Anybody ever sung that? Oh, yeah. I was usually on the back end of a shovel 100 degrees. Ah, oh, brutal. But work makes us who we are. When I was a young kid, my, I went to school, and I had brought a dirty note to school. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands, okay? It was a dirty poem or something. It was, I think I was in fifth grade or fourth grade. And I brought it, and I got scared because the teacher caught me with it, so I tore it up and I threw it in the trash. <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to tell this, but I'll tell it anyways. I threw it in the trash, but I had a good teacher. That teacher goes over there and digs that sucker out of the trash, tapes it together, and photocopies it for my parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The story gets worse. So I thought I'd get away with it. They get a call. I get suspended for a day of school, and I get to make up some work, and I'd never been suspended a day in my life up to that point. I was scared, you know. So my dad and my mom said, fine. You want to be suspended from school? I'll help you out. Let's go plant a garden. <laughs> so, uh, so on my day of suspension, not only did I have to make up all the work that I missed, but I get to go down there on my hands and knees and plant all kinds of vegetables and plant a garden. Guess what? I was ready to go back to school, right? Yeah, 
Another time, my cousin and my brothers and sisters, he was down, and we argued, and we had a wood-burning fireplace. Does anybody else have a wood-burning fireplace? Yeah, mine is gas. I no longer have a wood-burning fireplace. I have a fire pit outside my house. I bet that dude hadn't been lit a half a dozen times. But we had a wood-burning fireplace. That was our source of heat. We had ricks of wood. Now, if anybody doesn't know what a rick of wood is, it's about 8 or 10 feet long and about 5 or 6 feet tall, something like that. As a third or fourth grader, it looks like it's way up there. You know, it looks a lot bigger. But we were arguing and fighting, and my parents said, that's great, you got so much energy, I'll tell you what we can do. We're going to move that rick of wood. <laughs> so all of us got after it. We started moving that rick of wood, got it all piled up nice and neat over here. My mom and dad looked at me and said, you know what? I think I liked it better in the other spot. So we had to restack it in the other spot. Yeah, we were so tired, we didn't feel like doing anything else. But you know, it was times like that that makes you who you are today. And if, when we have the willingness to do, it's in those moments that we do for Christ, that Christ is doing inside of something inside of us that's causing us to change and never be the same. We're living out that transformational uh, life but we have to be willing we have to be willing to go and do some things and it's not easy whenever God calls you at two or three o'clock in the morning to get up and pray is it it's not easy whenever God calls you to go on a fast and you're you're praying for some people and you're praying for the church it's not easy when he calls you to be a volunteer in the church in some form or fashion but it's in those moments that we do and it is our willingness that God begins to craft us and to change us. In Psalms 118, or excuse me, here whenever Paul's talking about working out your own salvation, I won't get too deep into that for sake of time, but whenever he says work out your own salvation, he's talking about the process that we've got to continually work. Now, we don't work for salvation. That's grace. That's unmerited grace, unmerited favor. But what it is is, God, this is so important to me. I'm going to constantly come to you because I'm working to get and to constantly be, be used by you in a way that honors you. And, and we see it when he goes down and he says this. He says, fear and trembling. See, it shows us the attitude. This is that healthy fear of God, that respect and that reverence. As I was teaching Sunday school this morning, one of the comments that I made is if there's something that I'm very nervous about in the church and hear me out, I don't believe it's here at Ray of Hope and I'm not excusing us or acting like we're on a pedestal because that's not the truth. But in the church as a whole, it seems like we've lost our reverence for God. As long as we stick to the program, we've had church. As long as we don't do anything that really dishonors culture, then we've had church. And we've lost our awe and our respect for God as a whole, that we come into his house, we're in his presence, it's his son that I get this opportunity, that it's all about him. So I will raise my hands, I will raise my voice, I will submit my heart because it's because of him. Paul says we have to go in fear and trembling, this awe and this respect and this reverence. For our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Psalms 118 and 6, the psalmist pens these words. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. Now realize that he is not saying he is not being arrogant and enticing man to do something to him. This was ancient times. Men were pretty brutal to one another. That wasn't the issue. It was more of coming to the realization of willing to do whatever God told him to do. Whatever God told the psalmist to do, they would do. And I can't fear men. I can't fear man because I realize that man can destroy the body and hurt the body, but God has all authority and power over the soul. See, in Acts, they thought the same thing, and we think the same thing. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And once again, we find them in that same place. Are they trying to entice men like, bring it on? No, they had just walked through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They saw what men could do. They saw that. But despite that, they had a willingness about them. They said, I know what I've seen, I know what I've been through, but we still cannot do what only honors man. We have to honor God before man. That's that fear and trembling. We go into that place, whether it's a sanctuary or a prayer time or wherever it's at, and we go in and we say, God, I'm going to hold you in a reverence. And if we will do that, <laughs> a lot of things that God's asking us to do will be a lot easier to do. <laughs> 
I, I know that after I got disciplined a couple times from my dad, whenever he asked me to do something, it was a lot easier to do the second and third time, let me tell you. Okay, we got that straightened out the first couple times there, right? But we don't want to get to that discipline. We don't want to get to that. Peter, uh, excuse me, Paul continues to write. I got, I got to thinking there about some of the lashings. But anyways, anyways, for God, not very many of them, but they were good. I'm here to tell you, okay? Hey. <laughs> For God who works in you, once again, we see God works in us. You know, one of the hardest things is change. Oh, how many in here love change? Yeah. No, not one. <laughs> we don't like change. And it's not because we're stuck in a rut necessarily. It's because we know what to expect. But with God working on the inside of us, we can expect change. Because he's holy, he's pure, and I'm not. And he wants me to be there. Now, I know that I won't be there till I stand face to face before him. But I know I've got to continually work out that salvation as God changes me and works on us on the inside. And then he goes on and work for his good pleasure. He has things for us to do. He has things for us to do, but we have to be willing to do them. We have to be willing to go and say, God, what are you trying to do in my life? And you know, we've all been there. We are all, I think there's, there's equal ground there whenever we go to that place and say, God, I don't know if I feel like doing this or not, but I feel like you're telling me. At that point, what we don't, what we tend to do is, God, give me, give me clearer instructions. You know, if a big booming voice comes out of heaven and speaks to me, I'll go do it, you know? If somebody just comes up randomly and shakes my hand and tells me what I'm supposed to do, I'll go do it. Whenever we really should be praying for what? Willingness. God, I know you spoke this to me. I know you said do this. You've confirmed it in my heart, and you've asked me to change. You've asked me to go volunteer. You've asked me to do this or that. So now, God, help my willingness. Help my willingness, for I do it with joy, and I do it with excellence. Help my willingness. But we have to be willing to go do those things that God has called us to do. John chapter 7, verse 38, very familiar. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Multiple rivers, that's plural. That's because we're not meant to be stagnant as Christians. Rivers that flow bring life. That means we go out and we do. We're water that moves. We're light that shines in the darkness. Now we know ultimately that Jesus Christ is the light, but since I've hidden myself in him and he is in my heart, then I get the privilege of being the light of the world. It's not something that I have to do. I can walk in the world because we have the answers, because I have the answers, amen? Yeah. But rivers of living water will flow. Titus 3 and 14, it says, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good work so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. Paul is writing to his friend Titus, which is actually a Gentile, and he's saying, listen, we have to become devoted to what we do. There are people out there that need our help immediately, but as we look back on our life, we don't want an unfruitful life. We have to have a willingness to do, to share the truth, to inspire, to build up. And we know Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith it's impossible to please him. But we know that we need to believe that he exists. But the very last part of that is he is a rewarder to those who seek him. And we go back to what we see, the good, good father that we sing about so many times. That if we'll have a willingness to be transformed, that if we'll have that willingness to be obedient and be ruled by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then we'll have the obedience to do what he's called us to do, we have that willingness, then he is a rewarder of those who do that, who diligently seek him and say, I'm going to put things to the side to walk in what you've called me to walk in. But we have to be willing. And finally, the last thing here is a willingness to pass it on. We have to have a willingness to pass it on. You know, whenever God does something in our life, sometimes we can be hesitant to tell others because sometimes that change is so great, we don't know how to describe it. Sometimes it's so miraculous, we don't know if it's real. We don't know if it's just a feeling or an emotion or if Christ has really changed some things in our life. But we know that he's a transformational Christ, therefore he's going to transform my life and I need to allow people to know that and we need to pass it on. See, we've arrived to a spot in our generations where we have forgotten what the past was like. 
We no longer teach history in schools, the true, pure history. We, we, we teach kind of what we want to teach because we don't want to offend. But if we go back and see the sacrifice that is taken to get us to where we're at, then we may be a lot more appreciative of what we have. But we have to go back and we have to pass it on. We can't skip over history. We can't act like it didn't happen. But we can't get stuck on it either. That is stuff that we cannot change. But there are true sacrifices like today as we celebrate Memorial Day weekend and tomorrow Memorial Day where we teach our kids the true sacrifice that there was really kids that was not bummed about not getting a senior trip or only getting to go to Oklahoma City or Six Flags instead of going to two or three day nights because they were on a bus to being shipped to Vietnam. They were on a bus being shipped to fight the axis of evil in World War II. That's what really happened that keeps us from those things. And when we remember those situations, we know what we have today. But we have to be willing to pass it on. We have to be willing to say that if you pay a bunch of people for not doing anything, nobody's going to go to work. <laughs> if nothing else, we've learned that. And we can't act like it's not true. And we have to be willing to embed that into our next generation. That's what we see with Paul. Paul does it with the good, the bad, and the ugly. In verses 14 there, chapter 2 of Philippians, he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. He takes them to the point, man. He says, listen, quit complaining. Quit arguing. Do what God's told you to do. Honesty. But that's how we pass it on to the next generation, and there's some things that we truly have to do. There's some hard things, some things we've got to push those excuses out of the way. Verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. I love that from Paul, holding fast to the word of life. We know that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the word of life, Jesus Christ. Because you're going to be experiencing some things where you're going to need a rock. If your Christianity's never cost you anything, I want to know about your Christianity. Because Christianity is going to cost you relationships. It's going to cost you some sacrifice that you don't even see coming. It's going to cost you some sleepless nights. It may cost you some positions at work. It may cost you even some honorable, respectable positions in your family where people close the door and they no longer want to visit. And you think, how in the world can this be? Because that's what Christianity does. That's the reason why we hold fast. Think about this, that terminology, hold fast. That means there's a hurricane coming. Or in Oklahoma terms, there is a tornado on its way. You better find a place to be secure. And in the world we live in today, we better be holding fast to Jesus Christ. Amen? He goes on in chapter 17. If I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Bad things are going to happen. But we still need to keep an attitude of excellence and joy. We still need to rejoice in the Lord. I got to go to an OSU game. I'm not necessarily an OSU fan, but I had never been to a football game before, and it was four or five years ago. And I had special tickets. Anybody ever had special tickets to a game? Oh, man, they make you feel important one time in my life. So this ticket comes on, and it comes in a lanyard, and it's a, it's a square. Like, I still have it, dude. That's how proud I was. I didn't even care who won the game. I think they played K-State. Didn't even care about the two, right? I went because I felt special. I had a bird's eye view. So we climb up this elevator, and we go up there, and, there's, and this was free. It's not something I bought, so it was just a blessing. But I go up there, and there's this big buffet of food, and you can go over here and eat, and you can go over here and get all the free ice cream you want. You know, I just went in and out all the time. I was like, excuse me, excuse me, you know, I was trying to get to the food. If Beverly Hillbillies went to the OSU game that day, right? I'm out there, I'm having fun. This is fun. Food for everybody, football. All right, we're all having fun. Fun, 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 right? But I had a bird's eye view and I felt so special and so honored that I got to, be a, that I got to partake in, front of, in that. Listen, we have the best seat in the house. We have a seat that we get to look through Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. And yeah, he's going to ask us to do some things, and we're going to have to say some things, and we're going to have to say no to some things. But that's okay because we have the best seat in the house because we know that we can have complete victory through Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. And it's our willingness that leads us to that point. It's that willingness of saying, God, what are you taking? And we all have to work in that area. We all have to work in that willingness. There's mutual sacrifice in there too. We're all in that same boat. Yeah, we sacrifice for things in our own household, but we know that as a congregation, as a church, we see the bigger picture, the church in a whole, the kingdom of God. And we have to be willing to sacrifice. 
want to bring you back to the Garden of Gethsemane for a moment. Matthew 26, Jesus has gone to pray and he's asked his disciples to pray here. He comes back to check on them and he says his famous line 26 verse 41 of Matthew, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, these were the guys who had been with Christ, and y'all know that. Christ would go into town, and the Scripture says that he would heal them all. It didn't say he would just heal the ones who believed in him or thought about it or anything like that. It says that he would heal them all. These guys were witnesses to Jesus, began to teach, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowd get so mad that they would rise up and pick up rocks and want to stone him, yet they saw Jesus slip through the crowd. They would see Jesus go from town to town and be rejected. And when there was just a hint of taking care of the town and destroying it, Jesus would rebuke them and say, no, I've come to give life. One of the most critical points in Christ's life, he needs his people around him to pray. Don't fall into temptation here, men. I need you. And he comes back and he finds them sleeping. The spirit indeed is willing, so he wasn't attacking their spirit. He knew that they had been around him enough that they knew what he was doing was real. But it was that ugly old flesh that they had to pray against. It was that flesh that saying, God, make me willing. I want to crucify it day after day after day. Because I knew the spirit, I know the spirit that you've birthed in me is real and true. And it will take me to places that I didn't think I could go and do things in the name of the Lord that I didn't think I could do. But my flesh will stop me from reaching those points. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I think about us. And we come to that place of solidarity. Or if it happened to the apostles, it's going to happen to us. We're going to have to come to that point where Christ is asking us something after we're exhausted, after you've already fought the fight and fought the fight and fought the fight. You've been believing, you've been believing, you've been believing, you're exhausted, night after night, day after day. And the spirit man inside of you is like, I've got to keep going. But the flesh inside of us is weak sometimes. And we give in. And we get to that point where we say, God, I don't think I can go any further. Now, we understand that God is a forgiving God. But we have to pray for that willingness. We have to look at that prize and say, God, what are you trying to do? Because I don't want to give up on this. Now is not the time to quit. And I would speak to you that this morning. Now is not the time to quit. You're fatigued. You're frustrated. You're aggravated. It's part of Christianity. Paul said rejoice anyways. You don't think it's fair. You don't like what's going on. You didn't ask for it. Paul said to rejoice anyways. Paul talked about him being poured out as a drink offering. That's how bad his situation was. The constant anxiety, the constant imprisonments, the beatings, these type of things. The emotional stress on his body. He said he'd rejoice anyways. Because whenever I rejoice, I realize that I can continue to keep going. My spirit alive, my spirit man continues to stay alive inside of me. And I can submit my, I can, I can beat my flesh into submission. Beat it daily, <laughs> beat it weekly, whatever you need to do. But God, I want my spirit to be willing. And whatever you're going through, you keep going through it. You don't give up. Keep doing those things that you know to do. Would you bow with me? Father, our heart is bowed to you. And we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, we know that we have complete victory. We know that we can walk in the spirit of willingness. And as our hearts are bowed, whether it's through the device that they're streaming on or here in the auditorium. Take a moment and say, Christ, where's my heart? Because if I haven't fully submitted to you as a transformational God and my life to be transformed, I can do that now. 
I don't have to wait till I'm in a church service. We don't have to wait until we're in a Sunday school class or the right place where we sit right now. We can ask Christ to come into our life and transform us. And that is the first step to the willing spirit. And as our hearts are bowed and you deal with hearts, let us come to the end of ourself. If you're in that place this morning and you say, Pastor Matt, that's me. I haven't submitted, but I know that I need to. Maybe you're scared or a little bit fearful. You've got to push that out of the way and say, no, I know that I'm going to a God who loves me. God, deal with the hearts in only the way that you know how to deal with them. Speak to them in your way, God, not our way. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to be brave and courageous and raise your hand. That's me, Pastor Matt. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? Say, Pastor Matt, that's me. Amen, amen. Father, you know what's going on in the hearts and the lives of your people. God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you're really that loving God that says, come, set, and reason. And we know that we have Jesus Christ as our advocate. We know that we can have the complete victory that you've promised us, but it's only through Jesus Christ. We don't have to be caught in the sin cycle. We don't have to be caught in the anxiety cycle or the depression cycle or any of those other things that can rob us of that joy. We don't have to be scared and fearful. We can continue to walk and build on the right foundation. If you're in the house this morning and you say, Matt, that's me. Sometimes I get in a place where I really fight my flesh. Sometimes it wins. Maybe you're in that place where God is speaking to you something specific, a place to volunteer here at the church, a ministry to be a part of, somebody at your work or something at your work, and you've been reluctant. God's opened up a door for you to speak in somebody's life, and you've just been reluctant. You don't mean to disrespect God or dishonor God. That's not what this is about. You just know that God's speaking to you. If that's you, I want you to join me. I know my hand is up in the air. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor Matt. God's doing some stuff, and I'm excited about it, but I want to make sure that I have the willing spirit to do it. Would you stand across the sanctuary with me? As you just stay in this moment of worship with your heads bowed, I'm going to ask our prayer team just to come forward. Some ladies and gentlemen that would like to pray with you. And if you were one that raised your hand, I want to release you to come forward and find somebody to pray with up here. You can just come up here and stand in the middle if you need to, and we'll just pray for you. This God has been speaking something to you. We want to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. Would you just stretch a hand out to these who come up front? Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, God, of what you're doing in their lives right now. Maybe commitments that's being made. Openness to doing what you've called them to do. Complete surrender. God, you know the situation, and we thank you for that. God, we just want to pause just a moment here as they pray. God, that they would have that moment with you where you speak to their heart, you encourage them, and Father, you continue to transform them. And Father, as your people, we pray that we would embrace that transformational life, that change that's in us, that change that's around us, God, we would do it for your glory. God, we would have a willingness to teach and to volunteer and to speak 
but most of all, to honor you in all that we do. I thank you for this wonderful people today. Thank you for this congregation. And God, we thank you for this wonderful Memorial Day that we get to celebrate. We thank you for the men and women who have given the greatest sacrifice of their lives that we could live in a country with so many freedoms. We recognize that. We thank you for our military and our first responders, everyone who has a part in keeping our country safe, God. Bless them and protect them, we pray. God, keep us safe. Let us go out and do what you've called us to do this next week. We love you and we praise you. And everyone says, amen, amen. Hey, we love you guys. No church tonight, but we will see you Wednesday. We will see you Wednesday. Amen, amen. Thanks again for being with us today. We hope you enjoyed the message, the service. You know, life is so much better together, and we want to invite you to be here in service with us. I mean, live action. Uh, you know, maybe the COVID thing is not completely passed, but I think you're going to be safe, and we'd love to have you with us uh, every service. So have a great week. We'll see you next time.